Last fall, I made a video about Fresnel lenses, a technology invented for lighthouses that since changed everything from cars to spacecraft. And as part of that video, I got to spend an afternoon with Nick Korstad, the owner and lighthouse keeper at Big Bay Point Lighthouse on Michigan's Lake Superior. But Nick and I didn't just talk about Fresnel lenses. He also gave me an incredible introduction to the world of lighthouse keepers. I got to learn a little about what his life is like, but also what it was like to take care of one of these buildings a hundred years ago. And along the way, I learned that being a lighthouse keeper is probably one of the coolest and most difficult professions I've ever heard of. So here's the rest of that interview with Nick. It'll include some of what was in the Fresnel Lens video, but overall, this is a whole different side to the story. If you haven't seen that first video, no worries, I'll get you caught up. So this is Big Bay Point Lighthouse. It was completed back in 1896 and was designed to create a beam of light stretching 28 miles to the horizon. That way it would light the area between Granite Island and the Huron Islands and also would prevent any ships from crashing into the point. Throughout history, the lighthouse was cared for by various lighthouse keepers and their assistants. And even though the light is electrically automated today, the building still has somebody caring for it. Nick Korstad. He grew up interested in lighthouses, and then as an adult, started on kind of an incredible adventure. Yeah, so this lighthouse, uh, a lot of people always wanna know how you own a lighthouse, and uh, <laughs> that, that's the, probably the, the biggest question, but these land-based ones, a good collection during the Great Depression, uh, were selected to be de-staffed because mm -hmm. the Keweenaw Peninsula had the waterway that was going through there, so okay. our shipping routes changed. So they didn't need to have our fog signal, so we had to have a large fog signal building at the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. And so if you couldn't see the light, you had to have an audible sound. And uh, because they didn't need that, they had invented uh, acetylene valves that could actually run the lens without needing to have any lighthouse keepers on site. So uh, this lighthouse was de-staffed in 42, and then after World War II to help pay for the war efforts, 20 lighthouses throughout the country were sold at GSA auction as long you know as well with uh you know post offices these random things you see on these tv shows mm -hmm. and that's was to help pay off you know the, the war efforts from world war ii so huh. um, nowadays they have the lighthouse preservation act they do still sell lighthouses but they're mainly offshore lighthouses on cribs okay. you're very fortunate to be able to have one that's on land and there's a small little collection between uh, big bay and uh, mendota that you can own privately so maybe you just set up my next question sure how did you decide that like I want to own lighthouses yeah. or I want to own this lighthouse yeah. how did you end up there so lighthouses have always just been a thing since I was a child so I grew up on the west coast cool. we had lighthouses around us with lighthouse keepers still that was a, a job that was uh, dissipating very quickly and so I just went to college and did my thing working for hotels and moved up and after the last recession it was like you know I think I'm gonna buy one of these auctioned off lighthouses see if I can start a business with it but my end goal was one on land, you know, yeah. but when I was 24 years old at the time, uh, I couldn't afford the price tag for this. So I was the first person to start flipping offshore lighthouses. Oh. And then I flipped to get to this one. And so thankfully I was able to get it at the right time in the market. Throughout the afternoon, Nick taught me so much about the world of lighthouse keepers. And we'd only talked for like five minutes before I realized just how difficult his job is. Many people who want to own lighthouses or who are lighthouse people understand that these buildings are constantly in need of funds and it's just because they were built from the earth. You know, the bricks were killed on site, you know, the sandstone was quarried here and, uh, you know, the lumber and everything for all the beams and everything was from Ontonagon and it's all original old growth lumber. And, uh, you know, it's wanting to return back to its natural state, you know, so I'm always out here having to repoint and try and get everything taken care of. Okay. And uh, you have to paint the whole place every year. You know, got all the yard work and everything. Oh, right. And uh, then inside is every winter, is, that's what your job is. But that's the same as a lighthouse keeper. You know, there was 14 people who lived here originally and that was their job. You know, the kids had to come out and tend to the garden and the wife would take care of the inside of the house. And then the, the mill keepers would tend to, you know, the construction projects and the lens. And that's just the beginning. Before we went inside, Nick took me on a walk around the property, and I started seeing just how much grit has been required to be a lighthouse keeper at Big Bay Point. Originally, the oil house held uh, usually about 200 gallons of kerosene. Oh my gosh. And uh, that's what the lens used every night, and so the keeper would have to haul that from this fireproof house, which now, again, is just like a storage area, but uh, this is supposed to be explosion-proof. 
And uh, if you go to many lighthouses, you'll see them in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. But uh, yeah, you're welcome to go in. But you can still, you know, you open the door and, you know, if you leave that door open all day, that smell doesn't go away. <laughs> and then over here on this side of the house, uh, there was no indoor plumbing, obviously, back in the day. And so we did have two privies. Unfortunately, one of them was uh, torn down, I think, in like 2005. Okay. But uh, this would have been where you had to come in the snow. You had to go outside and use the facilities. And then you have a some sort of a tank that you'd have to pull out and, you know, put in the compost pile and whatever you did back in the day. You know, we have, we're the last power line right here. So we don't always have electricity out here. Okay. So we get a lot of storms, you know, yeah. Lake Superior, we'll start showing them here in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, it's not uncommon to have winds over hundred miles an hour out here on the point. What? Yeah. This is my third flagpole. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and they're solid galvanized pipe and you know, those things will just shatter in half. So this is your third flagpole. How long has it survived? This one has made it almost a year now. <laughs> and I've tucked all the pipe like two and a half feet into each section and bolted it. It's not like if it breaks again, then, you know, we're, we're done. We're not going to, you know. But yeah, we'll go inside. I can show you around real quick. Cool. And then we'll go up. We'll go look at the lens. I'll take you guys up to the top. We'll turn the light on. Get it going. Wow. Cool. Let's do it. All right, let's do it to it. So before we head inside, a bit of background for you. Early on, a lot of lighthouse keepers in the United States actually got their jobs through political favors. But over time, the system became a lot more formal. And in the late 1800s, lighthouse keepers became federal civil service employees. So they worked for the US government and their jobs were intense. Like I found a manual for lighthouse keepers from 1927. And because lighthouses were government owned buildings, that thing is detailed. It includes aesthetic requirements, like bright and glaring colors must not be used in painting interior walls. But it also has recipes for whitewash and putty for painting and repairs. This manual even has instructions for how to treat your guests and how to get your kids an education if there's not a school nearby. So it's not just that the keeper had to keep a light running, which was a task in and of itself, but they also had to operate and care for their property in a very specific way. And the job could be lonely too. At Big Bay Point, Nick mentioned that lighthouse keepers could live with their families, but that wasn't always the case. Like there were also lighthouses nicknamed stag stations. These lighthouses were especially isolated or were located somewhere off the coast and only men were allowed to live there, even if it meant they were leaving their families. Also, even if you had your family with you, I mean, it's not like every lighthouse is located in a thriving metropolis. Big Bay, Michigan is a town of only a few hundred people, and it was likely even smaller when the lighthouse was built. Still, that apparently didn't stop officials from showing up at your lighthouse and inspecting your furniture. Here's more from Nick. <laughs> Believe it or not, lighthouse keepers had a pride in their own furniture. Oh. So if you ever heard the term white glove inspection, uh -huh. yeah. that was uh, by the lighthouse service and they would come in and you would furnish your house and they would come in unannounced and they would put a white glove on and do something like this. And if there was any dirt on that, then you would be disciplined for that. So, what? but you'd be disciplined for not maintaining your own stuff. So, wow. but as you went up in the lighthouse service, you would go further up towards the city. Mm. So like Gross Point, Chicago is okay. right outside the city. Yeah. And so for your good, you know, 20 or 30 years of service, they'd give you a light station in the city. Traditionally, it was just, you know, mostly men out here in the middle of nowhere. And these were just very utilitarian properties. And they weren't decorated in uh, super Victorian lacy artifacts. <laughs> I couldn't visit a lighthouse without also learning about the light. So Nick and I spent a good amount of time chatting about the Fresnel lens that used to be the heart of this place. If you'd like more information about how this thing works and how Fresnel lenses keep showing up in everyday life, you can check out my first video from Big Bay Point. But the summary is that this thing is so good at magnifying light that it can make a kerosene lamp shine for 28 miles. Now, one thing I didn't talk about in that first video is how Fresnel lenses were cared for. And here, the lighthouse keepers of yore got a little help. So uh, the keeper kept the light going, kept the lens clean, uh, but there was a lampist for the district and the lampist is who ordered removed and you know assembled the Fresnel lens. And so if your lens wasn't turning at the right rotation, you would call the district and the lamp this would come out, basically the mechanic of the lens. And it was a huge gear system with all these regulators, you know, the brass spinny things, and they would go in there and tweak it. And no matter how fast you would turn that lens, it would re-regulate itself to have exactly the precise flash that you need to give. So 
And it's, you know, kind of like a grandfather clock in a way. Yeah. So the keeper didn't do anything with, you know, they just kept the lens on and clean. Okay. So they didn't maintain it. So, sure. and there's only five lampists left in the world. And so when we had to get this lens moved out here from the Maritime Museum, I had to hire a lampist. Huh. And we disassembled it and brought it all up in all the pieces. And he knew exactly how all the screws and bolts went together. Yeah, you know, just very lucky and fortunate to still have this on site. A lot of these lenses were uh, what they call gravity decommissioned. Okay. And uh, during World War II, they needed the brass. And so it was really easy to just take the lens and throw it off the side, bust out all the glass, and then they'd use the brass for bullet casings. So who knows how many lighthouses or people got killed with Fresnel lens bullets. So Gosh. it's weird to think about. <laughs> yeah. Someday, Nick hopes to put that Fresnel lens back up in the tower of the lighthouse. So as part of giving me a tour, he took me up into the tower and showed me where the lens used to be installed and where one day it might sit again. This is the watch room. So this is where the base of the lens was sat right here. Okay. And then uh, the gearbox would have went up to about here where this pedestal would have been attached. And the lens then would have gone through the floor and then connected to the top of the lantern room. So. I can see it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if we do put the lens back in, it has to be hauled up through this door. And so we'll have to get a hoist okay, and do this, it piece by piece. Does this yeah. just go to the... This is our gallery deck here. So this is where the lighthouse keepers would come to make sure everything was okay. Okay. And this is where you saw how windy it was in the yard, barely. <laughs> yeah. This is where the actual wind is at. So this is where I get all my, my good old wind observations. And I, I purchased all the land over here so we won't see anything get developed because we're one of the few lighthouses that you can even go to nowadays where there is no society around. So this is what you're looking at in 1896. Huh. So you can come out here and you can live that experience yeah. instead of looking down there and seeing like three homes. And right. you know you don't even see homes on the other side. Henry Ford actually owns all that land on the other side or the Ford company. Okay. Amazing. I went out to, that's 25 miles away to that lighthouse on that island. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, we'll take a boat out there. We went out like a couple Fourth of July's ago. And I was like, this is far as heck. <laughs> and then I had someone turn on um, the light. Yeah. Because on the way back, there's five different bays that look just like Big Bay on the other side. And I was like, I really don't know where Big Bay is. Like, yeah. and like, then I saw the light and I was like, yeah. dang. I, I understood at that point, you know, the importance of lighthouses. Because, cool. you know, even as a lighthouse keeper, sometimes I'm like, people need lighthouses for. Like, what's the point of them? Right. And then you get out on the water and it's it's really just a comfort. Like, oh, that is, you know, you're looking at your GPS, but our minds get lost if it's something that we don't recognize. And so if we're looking at something, our GPS says we're at Big Bay, but we're looking around from a, a water perspective instead of land perspective, yeah. we can't rationalize in our mind that we're in that spot. Sure. But when you see the light flash, you're like, that's Big Bay, that's gotta be, that's the lighthouse. Nice. Throughout the afternoon, it was incredibly cool for me to learn from Nick and his experiences with this place. And really, I couldn't end this video without including one of my favorite clips from that day. I asked Nick, if somebody takes away one thing from our conversation, what do you hope that thing would be? And I got the loveliest response. We have a lot of history in our country and uh, a lot of people and don't understand the sacrifices that lighthouse keepers gave because they were military service as well. And a lot of them didn't live out here with their families and their families lived other places. So when you go to a lighthouse, just remember, you know, the history behind it and that, you know, it's still doing its job, but the people gave their lives, you know, basically to ensure that the people at sea, you know, were safe and, you know, they didn't care about themselves or their families. It was about keeping this light going. Just look at it, look at the heart, you know, and all the love that goes into these lighthouses. And just remember that, you know, the men and the women that served for these lighthouses, it was a, you know, it was an honor in the day to be able to do that. And it's not just a building, it's, you know, it's a piece of history. You know, I own the lighthouse, but I don't. I'm really just someone filling the space until I die and someone else comes in, you know, so. My due diligence is to just keep this place as maintained as I can. Obviously, I just painted this not too long ago. Look all this stuff up here. It didn't take long. <laughs> so, yeah. Overall, moments like that are why I was so excited to make a different cut of my footage from Big Bay Point. And also, so many thanks to everybody who said they'd be interested in watching it. For me, talking with Nick was like stepping into this hidden world. Because yeah, he knows more about lighthouses and lighthouse keepers than anybody I've ever met before, but he's also an experienced lighthouse keeper himself. He's part of the legacy at Big Bay Point, just like keepers were a hundred years ago. And I am super grateful I got to learn from him.
If you'd like to learn more about Fresnel lenses and the current light at Big Bay Point Lighthouse, I think that story is also super fascinating. You can find the link to that video either in the video description or somewhere on screen. And as always, thanks for being here. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently. And I'll see you soon.